with the drivers thanks for joining us podcast live stream youtube in your truck on sirius xm thanks for coming in apologize if i sound a little weird i'm doing my best i'm like hopped up on sudafed claritin flonase and pataday pollen out here chattanooga's really bad but it's wednesday it's an exciting day although i got to start out with some really bad headlines we're gonna get into some good stuff today but we got to start out bad we got to start out bad you know why because J.B. Hunt put their earnings out, and they didn't come in that great. They posted a big Q1 earnings miss. Uh, operating income was down 30% versus Q1 2023. Does that surprise you at all? I mean, if you're a listener to the show, we've been talking to this. We've been talking about this market a lot. You know, we've been in this very long two-year freight recession, and of course, these uh, this situation, this market situation, is going to translate into these earnings numbers. Todd Maiden on FreightWaves.com, he has the full report on this, but they missed their first quarter expectations. Tuesday, reporting earnings per share of a they reported earnings of share of only a dollar twenty two compared to the consensus estimate of a dollar fifty. A higher tax rate was a seven cent headwind in that quarter for them. Intermodal revenues fell nine percent year over year as revenue per load was off by a similar amount. It's actually down five percent also from the fourth quarter. Total loads were flat year over year, but nine percent lower than the fourth quarter. A ninety two point seven percent operating ratio was 370 basis points worse than it was a year ago. J.B. Hunt's brokerage unit reported a $17.5 million operating loss as loads declined 22% year over year with revenue per load down just 5%. The unit lost $15 million in the fourth quarter. They've listed things like higher insurance expenses and integrated costs from the acquisitions of BNS, BNSF Logistics Brokerage. Those are some of the additional headwinds. You can read Todd's full breakdown on FreightWaves.com, but right now we have a message from J.B. Hunt's CEO, Shelly Simpson, who posted this to LinkedIn just yesterday. Let's take a listen. Hi, everyone. It's Shelly. Over the past several quarters, you've heard me talk about how we manage our business for the long term, we stay financially disciplined, and we are for you our people. When we take really great care of you, you take great care of our customers and ultimately our shareholders benefit. The current environment that we're in, it's been challenging for longer than most of us would have expected. We're facing inflationary cost pressures, the demand environment's fairly sluggish and deflationary price pressure. And that means our financial performance, it's not where we want it to be. Now, some of that's driven by the market dynamics and some is driven because we remain committed to our long-term investments in our people, technology, and capacity. But we're not standing still. We're putting in our work and our teams are challenging the status quo. Yeah, I mean, she said it right there. This freight recession has lasted longer than I think a lot of people anticipated. And it obviously makes it much harder because of those elevator rates that we had two years ago. All of the capacity that has flooded this market. We talk about that ad nauseum on here, not just the brokers, but the carriers, too. And the fact of the matter is there's just too many trucks out there. There's too many brokers and everyone's fighting for the same coin, cannibalizing one another. But let's go a little bit deeper because Kevin Hill, who was on our last show, he had an amazing report. He just put out some brand new research yesterday. Yesterday, and it was looking at 2023 gross revenue by freight brokerage cap. And uh, in this new port, Kevin Hill points out and Brush Pass Research points out that brokerage gross revenues declined 15.1% last year. That's across the board. Some other takeaways they put out, it said the industry is dominated by the largest freight brokerages. Their estimates show the largest 150 freight brokers account for 70% of the industry's gross revenue. A little Pietro pr principle over there. Top 3.5% of the 27,450 freight brokers with active authorities account for 88% of those gross revenues. Freight brokerage gross revenues are still 56% higher than 2019. Freight brokers control roughly 300,000 truckloads per working day. And at 15% average gross market, uh, margin, freight brokerage's true net sales for 2023 were estimated to be $20.24 billion. 
Andrew Silver, he said he checked out the transport topic list of 100 freight brokerages by revenue. The top 20 companies in 2023 accounted for roughly $69.7 billion. In 2024, the top 20 accounted for only $53.5 billion. Schneider, interestingly, had a big bump from $1.64 billion to $2.2. That was the only company in the top 10 and the top 20 that saw any increase in revenue whatsoever. Pretty big increase at that, too, as Andrew Silver points out here. And he said a couple at the uh, end of the top 20 fell off to the mid-late 20s. Redwood was one of them. They actually had the biggest drop in the top 20. They had, they got hit with $1.2 billion, fell down to $640 million. It's tough out there. It's tough out there. I appreciate all you survivors. I appreciate all of you who are hanging in there, who are fighting through this, who are making it to the next day. If you have any good tactics or tips, leave them in the comments. I'm sure everybody could use a little lifeline out there, including this one, because this just came into the news desk. I feel like every episode now, I've been talking about bankruptcies, and there's another one right here. A family-owned trucking company and brokerage, California Intermodal Associates, Inc., headquartered in Commerce, California, is ceasing operations after nearly 25 years, citing the state's independent contractor law. CEO Gabriel Call said uh, he recently notified customers that he is winding down operations, and he told Freightways on Tuesday, I blame AB5 for the main reason our company is closing. I might have to bring Matthew Leffler, Leffler back on here to talk about some of these AB5 impacts. I know Owida is still uh, trying to fight that one. We'll see where that goes in the industry. But hey, let's get to the rundown. It's episode 707 of What the Truck. And on this show, I'm talking to Dominic Angelo Tulo of TNR Oil Company about fuel fraud, scams, and skimming. I know that's been a big topic on here, so I had to bring a truck stop owner-operator in to talk about some of that. And he has his own firsthand experience with a scam that just happened to him that we want to warn all of you about. He'll be on near the end. It's been three weeks since the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse in Baltimore. Has cargo been disrupted? We got overalls Ronald Green. He's going to talk about the impacts in auto and other commodities. We might even get into uh, some cargo theft trends and, of course, risks to look out for. And we're going to start out with Daylight Transport. They've got a first of its kind building opening up in Texas. Greg Steele, Executive Vice President at Daylight Transport, is here with us right now. Let's welcome him onto the show. Greg, happy Wednesday, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Um... Should I call you Dooner, Tim, Timothy? Dooner's good. Dooner's good. Dooner, good. Uh, well, before we get started here, I got to tell you that um, in preparation for our time today, I did a little bit of research. I didn't know much about the Dooner, didn't know much about your show, but I do want you to know that you got a fan. You got a, oh. you got a new fan. I love your story, and I love what you're doing here and how you're doing it. Well, Greg, I have uh, I have some some new what the truck hats coming in. I have a big order coming in. I'll make sure to send you one of those for those those nice words Thank you me. had to put out there. Now, for people who haven't met you, they want to do a little research on daylight and a little research on you. What's kind of the elevator pitch on what you guys get into? Yeah, here's the elevator pitch for daylight transport. Privately held carrier, the owner and the founder is still the owner and involved in the business today. Wow. The origins of daylight transport is air freight going all the way back to the mid seventies and. And there's a nice little story, and I think that the, that you and your audience will enjoy this. But in the in the late '70s, Richard Breen, the original owner and founder, started off as an air freight forwarder, and this is prior to deregulation, moving deferred air freight from the JFK airport to the LAX airport, and it's two day, and it was two day air freight. Um, and this is back in the American Airlines when they made huge investments in the 747 and DC-10 wide body airplanes. Well, American Airlines offered an air freight service in the big DC-10 wide body, uh, wide body planes on commercial flights, and they called those cargo rates the daylight rates, and daylight transport was the very first air freight forwarder that, that, that partnered up with American Airlines, and hence the origins of our name, daylight transport. So there's a little bit of history, um, but after deregulation, we, we went to our customer base, and said, hey, um, I know you're really enjoying this two-day freight. Um, we can do it in three days and save you 70% on your, on your invoice. And we started, that's when we transitioned from an air freight forwarder to, to an LTL expedited carrier. And since then, we've just grown and expanded. And um, we still call ourselves a small guys in the midst, midst of all this LTL consolidation, but, but our sales will be just over 400 million this year. 
Oh, wow. Well, you know, I, l- let's talk about that really quick. Big LTL carrier, obviously, J.B. Hunt. We had to talk about their earnings. They were down. I mean, the whole market's been down for a lot of people. But I'm curious, is LTL Expedite, do you have a little bit more of a moat around you? Is, is, are you a little more protected in these kind of markets? Or are you kind of intrinsic on air freight volume? Yeah, um, I'd like to say that there's a moat. Unfortunately, if, if there was, then everybody else would be pursuing the same moat. <laughs> um, yeah, big moat. We, we are in a cycle. Being a California carrier, Dooner, we, we, are, we pretty much are too dependent, and we live and die by the Los Angeles and Long Beach ports. So going all the way back to 2022, when there were some real declines in the ports, um, and a lot of the traffic had, had gone to the other ports, while at the same time, Chinese manufacturing and exports had decreased dramatically, we started seeing declines. Uh, last year, we were flat. This year, we're up by 17%. I think overall, LTL trucking, from an economic perspective, I think we're doing, we're doing just fine so far this year. Very good to hear. Very good to hear. And, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is because you guys are growing. You're building something. You're grand opening something. I don't always want to give the impression on this show that this is like the most depressing world, like, and nobody's winning and nobody's doing anything great. You're opening a brand new First Fitz kind building in Texas. And I believe that grand opening is tomorrow. Tell us all about it. It is. Um, so th- these days, when any company is building out their physical infrastructure, it's a very strategic initiative. Um, especially in our space, the scarcity of industrially zoned land, um, but also the increase in cost of construction. And even today, um, companies like ours, when we're building infrastructure, we're competing with the remote workforce. And hey, don't hear me as saying that we, we are, we're combating against the remote workforce. We, we are supporting it and we're engaging and embracing with the remote workforce. But here's the reality. The reality is that there is a ton of value associated with meeting with your employees face to face, even if it is once a week. So we, when we are designing our facilities, going back to three years ago into this new facility, we're designing the facilities with the employees in mind. Now, um, it is a LEED certified facility, and it's also the first LEED certified trucking facility in the state of Texas. And we're quite proud of it. And you're right. Uh, we have our ribbon cutting event tomorrow. Interesting. So why why go this sustainable route? Why why the lead? Like what's important about uh, lead? What, is, what does that even mean to, to you and what will it mean to your customers? Sure. Um, well, sustainability and the reduction of, of, of carbon emissions is, is first and foremost. I mean, and even though in the state of Texas, this may not be at the top of the priority list, it certainly is in California and being a California carrier. That's where we started our lead journey. Um, but guest here or is he back what are they saying what's the word in the back there is no word in the back all right let's go to protest at the port let's go to the meanwhile throw the meanwhile at me this happened on monday now on the news you saw there were a ton of protests and uh, i think the golden gate bridge got almost all of the attention but at mar terminals there was also a protest that went down in elizabeth new jersey there was a pro-palestine if you see that car apparently anti-zim protest group went down there. They took the port by surprise. This is the first sort of port protest I've seen by these port protesters, but uh, here's what their message says. It says, for immediate release, pro-Palestine caravan, uh, port Port workers for peace led a caravan of vehicles through the port of New York, New Jersey, early Monday morning to denounce the Zim Shipping Company's support for Israel's genocide in Gaza. Zim CEO Eli Glickman has pledged his ships will assist Israel. So they don't like Zim at all. They're over there. And now because Zim is an Israeli carrier, it has become a target for some of these protesters. Now, I don't know if other ports are going to be targeted as well, but update your risk profiles because this is something that is going on out there. Hey, unfortunately... No, who's not protesting? Greg, he's back in with us right here. Let's get back to uh, these lead buildings, by the way. It's a crazy world out in logistics. There's a billion things going on, Greg. Yes. Um, so um, our lead certified building here in Grand Prairie, Texas, was designed to really combat with the remote workforce and motivate people to come back into the office and really just engage in daylight and daylight transport. 
you know, just, just as an example, in this one facility, 80% of all the lighting in the facility is natural sunlight. We've made, it, we've made it a point where every single employee and where they sit, they've got direct access to a large window to actually see the outside. One of the things you may not know, Dooner, but you and I, we spend 90% of our time indoors. We tried to create an environment here in Grand Prairie where it feels like you're just as much as outside as you are inside. So you had an interesting comment. So I was reading uh, an article that was on Freight Waves, and I have a quote from you. And it says here, if our people are truly our top priority, why not provide them an environment and workspace where they'll be happier, healthier, and more productive? So is this building, like, is, this, is a, this is an act of retention in some ways and, a, and an act of recruitment to bring workers in. They're workers first on this. It, it absolutely is. And um, our, people, our people love our facilities and love this facility here in Texas. Very. Are you going to build more? Or like, if this is a big success, you plan on to expand others or taking it one at a time? Well, we built the one in Fontana and have tremendous re success as a result. We built the one here in Grand Prairie and opening up, and we're building right now one in Jersey City, New Jersey. Man, so in that, hey, by the way, cross-border in that Texas market, you guys touch cross-border a little bit. What's going on with Mexico? That was a strategic initiative that we got going last year. So we are in the midst of creating the technology for a true door-to-door -door quoting and LTL tracking and, tracking and tracing solution. That'll be in place in June. Interesting. And th like this is LTL back and forth cross border. It is. Um, we're going to provide um, our newly gained Mexican shippers the ability to be able to quote a shipment from Mexico City and get it to San Francisco, California in four days. Wow. Wow. Not bad. How, how do people like find out more about that? Well, DYLT.com is certainly a great place to do it, but we, we've hired a sales team down on the border. And they're visiting with Mexican shippers today, face to face. Now, before I let you go, people who deal in LTL Expedite, what would you like? Like if you, let's say we're, we're on a sales call with every single customer out there, we want to warn them about something. What do they need to know about dealing with LTL Expedite right now in 2024? Well, I think the most important thing is if you're using a carrier and you're using them for speed of service, get to know their network to the point to see how many different handlings they've got to be able to get that product across the country. So we, we know through the Mastio surveys that the number one highest quality attribute of an LTL carrier is picking up that merchandise and delivering it in the same condition that it was picked up in. So I would say first and foremost, Dooner, is to check how many times that the cargo is actually handled. Very cool. Well, everybody check out Daylight Transport. Good luck with your grand opening tomorrow. And thanks so much for coming on the show. I'll send you uh, a hat when I get some in. Thanks, Dooner. Take care. Have a good one. Okay, let's go over to, uh, who do we got here? Ronald Green, VP of Business Development over at Overhaul. And we're going to talk about risk, all different types of risk. Ron, right before you came on too, like I, I used to work for a shipper called Talbots and I used to have to do risk profiles for them. And uh, if we saw there was now there's going to be protests at ports, we'd have to update that to us too. Do you, do, you, do you think, have you gotten any alerts yet? Like that Zim thing on Monday was really interesting because we hadn't seen any protests yet there. Is that something we need to be concerned about? That, this is a brand new phenomenon in the U.S. You know, have we seen it historically? It, you know, not to my knowledge. Um, if they have been, they've been few and far between, and you know, not not a significant impact. You know, it's it's kind of everybody's kind of feeling out what's what's going to happen. Um, we are putting it on our risk profile. Do we think it's a significant risk to severely disrupt or to, to uh, delay cargo? Yeah, I'm not feeling it right now. Yeah, maybe by a few hours. Right? There'll be short-lived protests that are maybe you know a few hours long or max a, a day and if they get more intrusive than that i think i think law enforcement will have to step in and you know try to try to direct them to a, a different area that's not disrupting cargo yeah I, I would say so so hey ron people who haven't met you before tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do over at overhaul yeah so uh my title is evp of overhaul you know i've been with the company since day one Long background in supply chain security. I've been building, helping companies build supply chain security programs most of my career. Um, I actually started out as a truck driver in college. Ooh. Drove over the road in the summers just to make a few extra bucks. So I've kind of seen all aspects of the logistics industry. Of, you know, working with all different industries, um, all different sectors around the world, you know, in supply chain risk problems. 
Well, one thing we got to talk about is some disruptions that happened. The awful incident, the Francis Scott Key Bridge, it collapsed. Mm -hmm. It's been about three weeks now. They're starting to make some progress. You got some video of them uh, cutting some of the tresses over there. What are you seeing in terms of disruptions, though? We know that that lane with that bridge itself was a hazmat route in Baltimore. We know that that port is very heavily involved in auto and, and farm machinery. Are we seeing any sustained disruptions? You know, one thing that the pandemic has taught the industry is the need to be nimble and flexible. And we're seeing logistics operations, you know, adapt and react to what has to be done to get their cargo moving, you know, diverting it to other ports, making, making alternate plans. And what I'm seeing right now and what hearing in the, in the media and talking to people is that the operators and co the companies moving goods in and out of Baltimore port historically, you know, have, been able to do a pretty good job of, of keeping their supply chains running. Is it more costly? Yes. Does it take more time? Yes. Are they anxious to get the port back up and running at full capacity? Yes. But in the meantime, they're going to figure out how to make it, make it work uh, any way possible. Yeah, you know, that that aligns with what uh, Ben Shurgi said. He said, and just like that, East Coast ports have stabilized. Capacity was tight in Norfolk and New York for about two weeks. Baltimore drayage carriers have sent their equipment to those ports that took on the extra volume. And now it's almost business as usual. Again, I mean, supply chain, it figures it out. Yeah, it, you know, logistics experts, supply chain experts, they're used to these kind of things. This is just one of the many things that happen every month around the world from a supply chain disruption standpoint. And they, they have you know plans how to how to reroute, divert, freight, really to make their keep their customers happy and keep freight moving. Who's benefiting the most from these diversions? Or is it those Norfolk ports? Well, I think I think Norfolk is the number one in terms of the uh, amount of capacity diverted to. And I actually wrote down my list here. North, Norfolk's one, New York's two, Williamston three, Newark is four, and other ports have picked up some of the the volume as well. Um, very, very. You know, one of the things that you know, there were some specific commodities that you know Baltimore was known for. One is coal, two is hazmat. Um, those those commodities require special infrastructure, storage. Um, you know, but my gut feel is people will figure it out and find a, find a way to get it done. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Go logistics. Let's talk about another risk out there, though. This one comes up way too often. There's even been mainstream headlines about people like. Uh, Courtney, Car what is it, Chloe, Car one of those Kardashian girls, her gummies got stolen. Someone stole a bunch of yogurt, $40,000 worth of yogurt. What's going on in cargo theft? We got a little bit of a uh, an infographic here. Show that one up. Yeah, what are some of these trend lines you're seeing? You know, we're, you know, it, it, it really is a whole new world in cargo theft in the U.S. You know, I, I study, analyze, research cargo theft around the world. I've been doing it for quite a while. And the U.S. is changing rapidly. The, not only theft rates are up, modus operandi's are changing, criminal profiles are changing. You know, one of the things that's hit our radar recently, not in the last couple of years, is actually criminal groups starting trucking companies mm. and starting brokerage firms with the primary purpose of stealing freight. Um, we, have, we have a list of them that we've identified, you know, through, uh, through our networks that we have over a hundred different entities that were, you know, were involved in cargo theft that operate legitimate logistics operations. And that's been our, one of our pain points recently, you know, getting these, you know, identifying these, these operators and, you know, putting alerts out as well as, you know, in our platform, in our system, you know, making flags. If something, if one of these operators tries to pick up a load we're, we're securing, uh, we, we work to get them off that load. Um, so that, that's been the biggest change, in my opinion, in the last bit in the U.S. cargo theft. But overall rates are through the roof. You know, some estimates are, you know, 400% increase, some are 200% increase. Nobody really knows. You know, cargo theft is one of those, you know, statistics that everybody kind of has a gut feel for, you know, what's happening out there. There's some data being reported. There's some other organizations report data. We report data. But nobody has a full picture. Um, it's just a, a fragmented it's statistic that everybody kind of tries to collect as much as possible, but nobody has the full picture of what's happening out there. 
you know, people have been showing me a lot of the scams that they have been receiving lately. And it's pretty clear from the way that some of these scams are set up that what you just said rings true. A lot of these people obviously have logistics experience. They obviously know how this industry works and they figured out ways to exploit this. And they found out that in a lot of cases, it's been pretty easy. But on your chart, the number one thing, 35% is pilferage. Is that that's just someone coming to the back of your truck, snapping like the seal and grabbing stuff out the back? Correct. Yeah. Um, pil- we, we categorize cargo theft in a couple different, you know, criteria. Pilferage is when they steal part of the load, not the entire load. They remove product from the back of the truck and take as much as they can. Sometimes it's a few boxes. Sometimes it's a couple pallets or more. Uh, that's a pilferage. That happens, you know, around the country. Uh, there are, you know, organized pilferage crews operating where they actually... They'll follow trucks from the origin. They'll actually case origin warehouses. So they sit outside an origin warehouse, wait till a truck leaves and follow it out and wait till it stops. You know, we recorded some of these pilferage crews following trucks up to three, 400 miles and waiting for it to stop before they'll hit it. And they'll wait for the wow. driver to come in, go inside, you know, you use the, uh, get, get somebody to eat, use the restroom. And they'll jump in the back of that truck, break the seal, break the lock, cut the lock, grab as many boxes or pallets they can in a matter of three, four, five minutes, throw them in the back of a van and drive off. And we see that almost every day in the U.S. Wow. You know, what also sticks out on here to me, too, is a lot of the newer theft that we're seeing. We have a deceptive pickup at 7% and last mile courier theft at 9%. Are those up from where they were previously? Yeah, again, it come, it, you know, l- looking at those specific percentages is probably you should take that with a grain of salt. We're reporting what we can collect and verify. Again, we're working with a subset of the actual entire data set. Um, my uh, deceptive pickup, in my opinion, is up. Uh, last mile courier theft is up. Um, and all across the board, everything's up. Uh, but you know, the percentages, I, I wouldn't get too specific on you know, one or 2% increase or decrease. It's kind of a general directional trend of what we're seeing out there. The, the the cargo theft by type had me interested, too. Electronics was number one. Um, we had food and drinks at number two. And then we had home and garden. They're, they're like theft rings, steel and flower pots and stuff. It's more tools. Uh, home and garden is a kind of a, a broad catch-all category. Think of anything you buy at Home Depot. You know, think of that. You know, there's a, we have a building supply category as well. Uh, but things you would buy for your house, you know, uh, could be uh, tools. It could be. Other, you know, fertilizer is a common one. Other, anything you would buy for your home or, home, or, home or garden, think of that as a category. You know, it's weird, too. I was looking at this, and there's cargo theft by type of location, and your own backyard is the least safe spot. It says right here, company yard or premises. That was number one. It was ahead of, um, I mean, by a little bit, not by much, but it was ahead of uh, unsecured parking and uh, warehouse in D.C. Yeah, well, if you, well, deceptive pick, pickup falls into that one. It happens at the origin, happens at the, yeah. at the, uh, spot is where the a trucking company comes in and they have knowledge of what's being shipped. They may have a pickup number. They may have all the right information to pick up that load, but they're not the right carrier. Uh, they could be falsifying an identity of a carrier. Uh, they could just have a pickup number that's accurate and the process and procedures at the warehouse are in place to catch that, catch that theft. If Very that time it's gone, it's too late to really get it back so many, many times. Ugh, big issue. Ron, before I let you go, any other risks out there that uh, shippers, carriers, et cetera, need to be worried about that they might not be thinking about? Yeah, no, it's, you know, the ones I mentioned are top of my list. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's, there's, you know, supply chain risk management is a growing field, you know, not just from theft, but just disruption, supplier management. It's, it's something that is hitting the C- C-suite, you know, conversations right now is, how secure is the supply chain? How stable is the supply chain? And companies are, are looking across their entire operation to shore that up, make sure there's nothing going to impact their, their operations that could have a revenue impact. Got it. Well, hey, Ronald Green, Overhaul, thank you so much for your reporting today. We appreciate your time. Everybody go check them out. All right. Thank you. Take it easy. All right, let's talk about the right of way. Elsewhere, what's going on? My buddy Joe Seppi posted this. 
caused a lot of drama online because a lot of people thought this was his video. So they were being very critical of his driving here. What we're looking at is there is a semi truck that is merging onto the highway and losing his lane rapidly. There is a truck in the other lane that was already on the highway and he really does not want to let this guy in. In fact, he is speeding up a little bit. You better not. He's mad now that the zipper merge has to happen. Bent his mirror a little bit. This dude destroyed my mirror. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Shannon3095 says, Bro would rather cause an accident than slow down or just switch lanes than post a video like it vindicates his poor choices. Spicy Goat said, Everyone saying it's the guy's fault for not letting him over. But if I went to court, he had the right of way. The truck entering the highway must yield to the traffic already present. Whether you agree with his actions or not, that's a fact. I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm not an attorney. I might need an attorney on here. Uh, but I don't think you necessarily have the right of way there because another part of insurance, another part of accidents is doing what you can to prevent one. Just because you have the right of way there doesn't mean you can speed up and hit this guy. He's in your way. Could you have relented? Could you have backed off and not hit him? And would that have prevented an accident? And did you not do that? That could put you liable. So don't think like you're some right of way maximalist all the time. If you can prevent the accident... Don't hit the car. They're going to see in your trip computer. Not to mention you're recording this, you bonehead. He says, yeah, this guy says the dash cam trucker actually increased his speed from 59 to 65. And uh, Aglo Deddy said for $50, I could fix that mirror and buy $50 worth of beer afterwards. Again, that was not Giuseppe's driving. But know who's on now? Dominic Tulo, GM at TNR Wheel Company. Dom, good to see you. Hey, man. How are you? I like the, uh, I like the, uh, I like the, like, the sign behind you. You got like sort of a gas vibe going. That's what we're going for, man. I mean, I'm literally at a truck stop. So if you hear any loud bangs or air horns, it's it's authentic. But that's where we're at. I'm shaking my head about that video you just played, though. I, I just I can't get my head around that. Yeah, you just slow down, right? Like what? Like there's you're not going to overtake the truck here. Just let him in. What are you doing? Yeah, like just prevent the accident. Like this could have been, this actually could have been a lot worse. Yeah. Than what it was. Yeah, people get too stupid. People you don't get stubborn when you're in like an 80,000 pound vehicle about something like this. When obviously you, it's your ego. You could let the guy go. 100%. Speaking of trucks, I saw on X you posted. Congratulations. You have a new one joining your fleet. What are some of the wins? Before we get into your tragic story, what are some of the wins happening for you guys? Uh, we did take delivery on two trucks in, in the last couple of months. Um, one dedicated diesel unit to do our overnight fueling and our daytime tank filling. And then we also took delivery on a stainless steel tanker, which is a dedicated diesel exhaust fluid tanker truck. Uh, that'll cover the Northeast for us. Um, thankfully, that, that's a growing division. Been really pleased with the growing demand for diesel exhaust fluid. Seems like the new trucks that are coming out and hitting the road are actually burning a higher percentage of diesel exhaust fluid. When we started the business, it was closer to you know, three or 4% of your diesel to death burn ratio. Now we're closer to five to 8%. So seeing some organic growth there, which is great for TNR. Uh, it's not great if, if you operate a big fleet of trucks, but you know, we're, we're real pleased about it. So yeah, thankfully we're seeing some nice growth and you know, we ordered those trucks about a year ago and it's still taking that long to get them. You know, those custom tanks are all, all built to spec for our needs, but yeah, it's, it's still taking a while, but yeah, all is good. I was well, hey, what about you caused a little bit of a, a minor panic online when you mentioned the Baltimore when the bridge collapsed. You mentioned the DF, that death fuel, there might be a problem because it comes through Baltimore. Are we in the clear? Has everything resolved? I won't know until probably April 27th. My supplier is one of the largest purchasers out of that port and one of the largest distributors of DEF uh, throughout the entire country. Has told me that they had 30 days of pro uh, product to operate through that port. And then by about May 1st, they won't have any more. So, you know, it's very possible that domestic has picked up and railed more urea into that port. That port brings in DEF from uh, Europe. Is It's basically brought in at 40%, and then it's mixed down to the 32.5%, which is what we use in our trucks. So it just depends um, if they kind of bulked up from domestic means in order to bolster their supplies. But I could expect um, this go around. DEF changes on a monthly basis. 
It tracks the NOLA index, which is basically the, the price of dried urea. We'll know on May 1st, depending on the price, how tight they're getting. All right. Well, I'll check back in with you in about 10 days here, once they're 10 or 11 days when you know. But now that I'm checking in with you, because about a couple of weeks ago, I was a little worried about you. You said you were feeling burnt out. There was a, a big scam or something happened to you. You got exploited out of a, out a lot of fuel. Tell us the story. What happened to you guys? Sure. Um, I'll take you through it step by step, and I'll try to leave out all the, the small details because it's, it's a pretty big story. But um, we had a call come into our office on a Tuesday afternoon where somebody was looking to open a fuel account. You know, this is very routine. Uh, the lady did not speak great English. Uh, so I turned her over to somebody in my office who is fluent in Spanish, which is very commonplace. We deal with a lot of dump truck guys and in our market, it's very common um, for them to prefer to speak to someone Spanish. So I turned it over to a lady in my office and she sends over two forms of paperwork. She sends over a credit application and then she sends over an ACH draft information form where we're actually going to take your banking information because checks are so slow, especially for a new account. We draft the money right out of a client's account. By the next morning, we received a full credit application with social security numbers, personal guarantees, uh, a company name that fully checked out. Everything looked great on the credit application, uh, references. And then the ACH form had uh, Chase banking information, um, which was a real account. It, it populated when we put it into our system that the routing number and everything looked great at, at high level. Uh, they also, uh, I, won't, I won't dox, but it was a popular uh, liquor distributor in New Jersey who entered all this information. So fast forward to the next day after we receive all the information, we send our first delivery out. And that first delivery was about a 2,000 gallon load um, to a yard of box trucks. Now, if it's a liquor distributor and you're delivering to not the headquarters, but you're delivering to a area of box trucks, that's fairly common. It's very commonplace to not have all your trucks where your office headquarters are. But on the credit application, they put a bill to and a ship to address, bill to being the headquarters and ship to being where the trucks are parked. The ship to address matched a Google listing that this facility at this co company had more than one address that there may be trucks at. So everything even checked out from Google uh, as far as where the trucks were versus where the headquarters was. We make a 2000 gallon, two, 2000 gallon delivery to this address and we're escorted to the tank by two individuals. And this is very common. Usually when we deliver for the first time, we're escorted to a tank because we don't know where it is. There may be more than one tank on the property. We're escorted to a tank. We fill 2,000 gallons of product. We then give it the meter ticket of the 2,000 gallons to the people who escorted us to the tank. At this point, we think that they're employees of this liquor company and, and they work on, on the operational side. This person then takes the ticket and we don't see them again. We go back, we run their banking information and we begin the drafting and invoicing process to pull the money out of this person's bank account. Everything looks fine. With a new account, usually we call the next day and just see, hey, we call the bank because the bank will know before we do if it's gonna bounce. I won't know for about four or five days if, if that uh, money is no good, but the bank can usually tell me within 24 hours. I call the next morning because they requested another delivery. Again, it's a big liquor distributor, not uncommon to need a delivery two days in a row for, for even a tank fill. So I call my bank first and I just said, hey, has this money moved? Has it gone through? And the representative for my bank said, yeah, no problem. Uh, the money actually looks like it's already in your account. So again, everything looks fine day two. I send my driver to deliver another 1,500 gallons and same story, escorted by the same guy to the tank, um, another another truck yard with with a with a fuel truck, box trucks, um, no big deal. Fifteen hundred, make the delivery, give the fifteen hundred fifteen hundred gallon meter ticket to the same guys. Everything seemed normal. Yeah, my driver was then contacted for a third delivery. At this point, you, they 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 started to get my attention. Something just didn't really seem right. My driver makes the third delivery, same story, escorted um, company with box trucks and uh, a fuel truck. 
we fill 4,000 gallons into a fuel truck. We do a full load. At this point, I got about $25,000 out, um, but everything kind of seems fine. My driver made the third delivery, and when he made the third delivery, called me and said, hey, they want another 10,000 gallons. And when he said that to me, my face like lit on fire. I, I could just, I could feel it. I could feel like, oh my God, I, I think I just got scammed. So I call my driver and I said, hey, where are you? And he said, I'm at a truck facility and there's box trucks here, but there's also a scrap yard and, and there's a lot of different companies. And I said, just, just stay, just stay there. Don't go anywhere. I get there. Now, the two people who escorted him were gone by the time I got there. It was about a half an hour. My dad and I drive out there together. So I go to my dad. I'm like, Dad, we just, something's not right. We get to this facility, and I walk into the customer who we actually delivered to, and I said, hey, I, I introduced myself. I said, hey, I'm Dominic with TNR. Um, don't know you. Never delivered here before. Who ordered this fuel? And the guy's like, what do you mean who ordered this fuel? We ordered it from you. You just delivered it. Uh, it's the first time, but what, what's the problem? They they didn't even realize that I was being scammed. Oh. So it was took us about half an hour to figure it all out. Turns out this was a whole double brokering scheme where the guys escorting us were acting like they were TNR employees to where we were delivering. And to us, they were acting like the employees of this liquor distributor. Oh. So they were actually oh, wow. double brokering the work. And when they went inside, they were collecting payment directly for it. And the part that blew my mind was the person I was invoicing was taking my invoice and then just sending it to the person who was taking the deliveries. So the third place when I showed up, they had a copy of my invoice and my jaw hit the floor. I was like, how do you have my invoice? I don't even know who you are. I don't have any of your email address. Well, the, the scammers were so sophisticated that they were taking it and then re-invoicing it, basically acting as TNR oil company. Um, now, I'm really glad, and, and I was actually supposed to fly to Matt's uh, that day, and if I had, we would this, this scam would have just kept going. There would have been no one here, really, who would have, who would have picked up on it. Um, so tying it all together, the banking information they gave me was stolen banking information, so I was drafting someone's bank account who has no idea who I am, probably some little old lady whose account got stolen on the internet. Um, I'm out for the money, and... Then I went around and called all the people I know in the fuel business. They were trying this with every other person in the fuel business. And Tim, the, the, like, the most impressive thing to me, man, it's hard to sell diesel. It's, yeah. I could walk into anybody right now and say, hey, I'll sell you diesel for below cost because that's what they were doing. They were just discounting my product so much. And odds are they wouldn't buy from me. But whoever this was understood the business enough and like, had an established book of business to be able to do this where they were able to string deliveries together that fast. So just very sophisticated Wait, and on, these folks knew what they were doing. Let me add, yeah, it sounds very sophisticated. Like, are, did they get caught? Are they gone like a fart in the wind? Like what happened to these, these uh, scammers? Yeah, um, we have all their information. I have great camera footage of them. Um, I even recognized who, um, I even recognized who one of the people was, uh, in the camera footage who took the second delivery. So there, there's a lot of information to be had. Uh, but yeah, but look, uh, there's no recourse for me. I won't get my money back. The best I can do is just warn everybody in the market about what's happening. Um, I have turned all this over to, you know, the, the powers that at B, uh, in order to get this stopped. It, but it's a sophisticated scam. From what I've heard, it's also happening in Florida. So whoever's doing it is doing it at a pretty large scale. It just seems like they have figured out the fuel business. But yeah, they're gone, man. Um, the address on the Google listing is fake. So they went through the trouble of getting Google to change someone's address, from which I understand it's not very easy. So yeah, no, they're, they're totally gone. There's, there's no recourse. All the trucks we filled, except for the last one. So look, the first two clients that we delivered to were definitely in on it. The third, where I actually showed up, they're not in on it. They got, they basically bought stolen fuel. The first two people were in on it. So um, I, I can share limited information about that because it's an ongoing investigation. Um, but no, there's there's really no recourse for me. Ugh, Dom, I hate to hear it. I hate to hear it. I guess the best thing is to just get the message out there and uh, 
to prevent this happening again. Unfortunately, that story was so compelling, but we're, we're almost out of time. How do, how do people connect with you? How do they reach with you? And how do they go get some fuel from you? I'm most active on Twitter, Dominic underscore too low. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you for, for bringing me up to tell me that. But yeah, anything I can do for you, just hit me up on Twitter. Quick lightning question. How many skimmers have you found on pumps before? Hundreds. Damn. Damn, 40 bucks, 40 Very bucks common. on eBay. Right, maybe we shouldn't yeah, tell the thieves that. Uh, hey, Dom, thank you so much for your time today, even if there's that frustration, but glad you got over the hump. It would have been great to see you at Matt's, but I guess I'm glad I didn't. You would have lost thousands of dollars more just by hanging down in uh, in Louisville. We'll take care, buddy. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on What the Truck. You can find this show wherever you get your podcast. Just look up What the Truck. You can find it on Freightways' YouTube channel, Freightways.com. And, of course, Sirius XM's Road Dog Trucking at 5 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. Eastern, Channel 146. And me, myself, at Timothy Duna. That's D-O-O-N-E-R on Twitter, LinkedIn. Take care, and don't be a stranger. <laughs>